could share. So this week was about back propagation and multi-layer perspectrons, mostly. Okay, so the beginning um, was about just motivating the rectified linear unit. Okay, so I kind of just remade his drawings in ggplot. So he started off just kind of drawing this line and saying, okay, we have this input x and we have one output y. Um, if we only consider linear functions, um, we have this line here. And maybe this line represents the probability of y being some value given x. Okay, we're only using lines, but suppose the true function that we're trying to um, recover is a curve. Okay, so this blue curve. If we're only using lit lines and we're only adding things together, um, we will never be able to get this curve because lines plus another line will just continue to give you a line. Okay, yep. so then he, we introduced the uh, rectified linear unit. So essentially, we start, instead of working with um, this line, we work with a piecewise line, where in some part it's zeroed out, and then the other part we have a line. And so if we think about adding these two together, um, we will have a change or sorry, on the left, we won't have any change. And on the right, we will have a change in X. So we can add them together and then we get something like this. So now we start to get kinky lines. Um, and then essentially we can um, maybe have another one, this blue one that's a little bit further to the right. And this red is the first two. And now, um, I guess I didn't add all three of them together, but now we have, the original line plus these two and then we could consider adding these two together and to get anyway so basically we can approximate curves by making these piecewise constant um, lines and we are still though fundamentally working with linear transformation so that was all the motivation for the rectified linear unit um, does anyone have any comments on that? No, I mean, the idea is we can approximate any curve with combinations of values, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's universal approximation theorem or something. There's right. actually a theorem for that. If you Google yeah. that, or you search that on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of videos. Let's look at it just now, see if this one I'd recommend. But there's a bunch of videos of that that demonstrate that. It's pretty cool. Um, a little animation that shows how it builds okay. up the curves. Okay. And supposedly and then, you don't need a big network to do that either, right? I mean, can't you do that no, with like no single? Yeah, uh, single. Yeah, I think it's as long as you have it wide enough is more important than deep enough. Hmm. Yeah, was it like, was it in this course where was it in this course where he was talking about how that was actually kind of one of the kind of led people astray for a while because because of the universal function approximation, everybody said all you really need is like one hidden layer and you can do. Um, you can, you can approximate anything. Therefore, let's just make wider and wider, wider hidden layers. And it wasn't until later people realized, hey, we should go deeper instead, even though we don't need to <laughs> tech theoretically, but it, it does make things more efficient. Yeah, it might have been this course. Sounds it, it oh, yeah. seems so like a long good. time ago now, but we've kind of, know, kind of right? come back full circle again. I think you're right. We have come back. This all sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh. Yeah. So we're going to use that ReLU as an activation function for our neural network. Um, and so this is the notebook he has in the video. And I just sort of added, because I never downloaded this data, I stole this from the first um, note, notebook. And when I opened this in Colab, it didn't to be honest, I don't use notebooks a lot. So <laughs> I, at first it was saying like, yeah, like this, like everything is hidden. Oh shoot, now I'm gonna have it ruined again. Um, and I had to like, 
select all cells. When I showed code, it added all these titles here. So I don't know if that's just like a thing. Oh my gosh. So that yeah, do we know it. what that, that decorator means? I don't know. It wasn't in Jeremy's notebook. It was just okay. when I opened it in Colab and I huh. tried to un unhide all of the cells. I guess I could Google it later and let you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let okay. me get a Colab specific thing. I don't know. Yeah, so. And it's commented just... out. So does that mean it's not really doing anything? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't think it's a decorator. I don't think it's a Python thing. I think it's a Colab huh. notebook thing. Okay. Gotcha. Not sure though, but yeah, I don't know. So this is all of the setup, and then um, this is for the digits, I believe, because we're going to talk about just talk about mean squared error. So we have oh, go away, fifty thousand images of seven hundred and eighty four pixels, and there are mm -hmm. zero to nine to ten digits. Okay, and then we'll have a one layer with fifty hidden units. And we can initialize random weights and biases for, let's see, M is the number of pixels, 784. But, and then we um, are going to do matrix multiply so that we get 50 um, hidden units. We need 50 biases. And then we will output um, to one value. I think we are only considering I think, um, I don't remember now. Oh, we're just gonna predict one number and see how close it is to, we're gonna treat the class of zero to nine as numbers. And we're gonna use mean squared error as our loss. So our output is just one number. I have okay, the answer that. for that thing if you're still curious. Oh yeah, curious. go ahead. <laughs> so what, it, what that is, is that's a collab special thing. So when you hide a cell, you can uh -huh. give it a title so people know it's in the hidden part. So you can do that with a hashtag, oh. add title, and some string. I guess so if you hit when you hit a bunch of cells with nothing that create it, put those in there for you with blank gotcha. titles when you hit them all. Huh. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. This was the easiest way I knew how to open this. <laughs> um. Okay. So we're defining a linear layer. So we have matrix multiplied times the weight plus the bias. Okay, so here would be the first transformation, T, and we get, an, um, this is our training data is only 10,000 images, or no, sorry, a validation data is 10,000 images, and we um, went down to, from 784 to 50 hidden units. This is the ReLU activation, we will um, essentially zero out. And now uh, let's look at maybe here before, before and after. Oh, wait, I don't know if I can do that. Okay, so now when we do, the, this is the original tensor and now anything that's um, less than zero. zero is zeroed yeah. out. Yeah. It looks like. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so with those two things, we can define then the multilayer perceptron. This is the model. We first do our linear transformation, then we do the um, ReLU, and then we return this linear transformation to the one dimensional space. And we get this result that is just a bunch of numbers. Okay. All right. Let me see. What do I have to do? Sorry, these are have this is has what I'm supposed to do next. Okay. So the loss we're starting with is mean squared error. Uh, I took a screenshot from the video. And this is just a showing the dimensions. Although here we had 10K for the validation set. We go from mm -hmm. the original data times the first uh, transformation to 10 units. This gives us our first layer. And then we have all of these numbers, zero, 
for the 10 um, classes. Okay. Or I guess we had 50 here anyway. But we're just going to consider the mean squared error. Um, although with the caveat, this is not suitable. We're just using this to work through our understanding, making sure um, Jeremy sort of pushes this idea that we as the students in this class should be able to predict what are the sizes of these objects and we should really get into um, the nitty gritty and make sure that we understand how everything is matching up. Okay, so the result, as we mentioned, is this vector, or sorry, we have a uh, two-dimensional object from our MSC or model function. But our Y, which has the labels zero through nine, only it's one dimensional. So this is just illustrating that, okay, you do need to, um, and maybe this is calling you out, Ron, that you need to check your broadcasting. Um, right, so if we broadcast this, you got to the same subtract. thing. I got to this part too. Like, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we subtract to get the MSC, right? Because of broadcasting rules, when we go from right to left, um, we will not have a vector of 10,000. We will have a 10,000 by 10,000. Yeah. So if you just subtract these two with these given shapes, um, the result is 10,000 by 10,000 because of the broadcasting. Okay. So you either need to drop this shape, this one, or I guess add a one to the Y valid. And he just dropped. So this is the index, looks like indexing syntax to drop the first, that um, first dimension. This is the squeeze function that drop unit dimensions that are leading. And he also, tested, I think, for, or sorry, this is for trailing. I think he also tested for leading, and I'll be honest, I don't remember what happened. And that squeeze thing, it, that's a PyTorch-specific function, right? I'm guessing so, because this is a torch object. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think it was. I don't remember how to, how do I get the help? We do like the question mark it's after. Past. Oh. Or yeah. Um, yeah, torch that squeeze. There it is. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so we have to make sure because we know that when we do the MSC, we should be subtracting these things by two, essentially two vectors. So we have to translate what we know is supposed to happen to what's happening with our torch. Okay. So now we've confirmed that we need to do this transformation, or sorry, this um, dropping of dimension. All right, here we are now running it on the training data. We define this MSC function with the dropping of the zeroth dimension. And there was a question in the video from the class and Jeremy claims that this makes this function more generalizable to other projects, but I guess I don't really know. Are, are you saying about. what 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 dropping that one axis as opposed to using squeeze or as what? opposed to doing it before running MSE? Oh. Like maybe doing it yeah. here like pred something, some pred that squeeze. I see. Huh. Yeah. Okay. okay. And our MSC is going to be horrible because we had random weight biases. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So now we can talk about how do we improve our loss, right? And the thing we have control over is the value of our weights and biases and how do we 
smartly choose them. Okay, and so we're going to use gradients. So what do I have now? We're um, reminded of our discussion before about stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so the smart way to choose how to change your weights and biases are to move in the negative direction of the gradient. Okay, the gradient, then we discuss this gradient matrix. And that is when, if your output, so for example, if we were to do this classification and we had 10 outputs, okay, we would have a matrix for every 10 outputs and every dimension of the input. But for stochastic gradient descent, you really have to define a loss function with only one output. So typically our gradients are just a vector um, where the dimension is all of the parameters. So every weight and bias that we have as a gradient. Okay. And so we started talking about gradients. So he introduced all of these um, his resources, he goes back to this matrix calculus you need. I haven't read this, but um, I kind of do a lot of calculus every day of my life. So, <laughs> yep, um, same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, this is sort of a picture of um, what he was describing. So, we have, you can think of all your weights and biases, you can vectorize it. Okay. So, our inputs are you can think of as a vector, our output, our loss would be a scalar. So we're going to be in this part of the, um, this little picture here. This would be if we had multi-dimensional output. Um, and then we have our weights and biases, we would have a matrix. Okay. And essentially all a gradient is, is it's a derivative, but because you have a multivariate input, you can't, call it a derivative, you have to call it a partial derivative. And that's basically just a semantic thing. All of the things you learned about calculus will still work. Okay. Okay. So there's an even smarter, so you can um, remember, either remember your calculus or here is an example of using symbolic differentiation. Okay, so this is, we're defining the symbols X and Y. Um, I suppose it's probably like using expressions in R. And you just say, I want the differentiation of X squared with respect to the symbol X. Okay, and it says, okay, that's 2X. So symbolic differentiation is pretty cool and it basically just works on, on it just, you tell the computer all the rules, the basic rules of differentiation and it can just figure it out. Um, here, we are starting to talk about the chain rule. Okay, and uh, so Ronnie said you do calculus a lot. Aaron, are you a, like- I'm, I'm pretty, Pretty good with, with calculus. We don't need to confident. Okay, well on cool, it. Yeah. 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 So the chain rule, right? If we have X squared, you can think of that as um, the composition of two functions, right? X squared and then this linear combination. Where, uh, so we have the chain rule to give us 6X. Okay. The cool thing about the chain rule with the way we set up this multi-layer perceptron is that, and here, I thought this was actually pretty cool. I'd never seen this before. This is a a visual of the chain rule. If we think of the composition of um, these functions, right? So the derivative, the u dx, is how many times basically does u turn for one turn of x, which is because this wheel is half the size of this wheel is two, and then uh, these two are connected, they're mm. the same size as one. So you could do the chain rule and say like um, dy dx is one times two or something, which is two. Anyway, I thought it was cool. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see here. What are, what's up here? Where am I? Here. Okay. We're kind of here. So let's go through some of the code here. Okay. So for our multilayer perceptron, we have the two function, the linear combination and the ReLU. This is defining the gradient of a linear function. So if we have an input, output, weights, and biases, the um, derivative is just, right, the bias gets lost. So it's just, um, let's see, the weight. Yeah, and then, okay. All right. Okay. So here is our forward and backward function. So in the forward pass of our multi-layer perceptron we first do the first layer linear then we do the relu then we do the linear transformation to the output this is the difference that we calculated earlier and this is the mean squared error the backward path because of the chain rule right we think of this as the composition of function so you start here at the last function which is mean squared error the derivative of a square is two times the input, okay, which is the difference. So we have the output gradient is two times the input. Then we have the linear gradient. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay, yeah, so we have this multiplication inside the linear gradient, right? So as we go backwards through the chain rule, we have to multiply each of the previous um, gradients. Okay, so the first layer gradient is two times then the linear gradient is just the weight. So we do the weight times the previous one. Then the second one is ReLU, which is the derivative is um, this, this part. It's either zero where everything is zero or, um, I'm sorry, this is the gradient here. This is just, saying the input um, to the, I'm getting myself confused. But anyway, <laughs> this is just going backwards and multiplying the gradients as you go backwards in that composition of function. From MSE, linear, ReLU, linear. Okay. Does that make sense? I just botched that, but. <laughs> I don't know, I had to like, <laughs> last time I did this, which I didn't do it during this particular week but um I, I had to write it all out like you know summation formula oh, like, like just do the differentiation yeah. see how it all works because now you get that transpose in there and the rest of it so it, it was not totally straightforward um yeah this is like the msv of diff yeah. uh d diff and then this is the multiplication oh, yeah. this what is the multi it out what uh, I wonder why you attach it to the out.g rather to the, like, I don't know, diff.g or something. I don't know. Well, I think I each, doesn't matter. Yeah, each one, each layer gets its own gradient. This is um, oh, times I see. now the DL2. I totally the, missed them. This is like the, um, the input to the second layer. L2 input, I guess. And then it keeps going. This is some, this is the relatively one. Which is, oh, I see. Yeah. So basically, this is just a relu on this great L1 gradient, right? So, or sorry, L2. The gradient of the, the relu is going to be zero or the same. As what it was on the L2. 
And just to be clear, L2, we mean layer two. Yeah. As opposed and, to like regular, yeah. regularization. Yes, or yes. Like that. No, no loss. <laughs> We're not yeah, doing that yet. Two. Yeah. Yeah. This is then, yeah, so we'll just like keep at, adding one on. D. Um, these the input to row right so instead of doing the derivative from the first input like um, weight one it's just you think of it as the composition okay Okay, so we define this. This will give us the input target. This will just change, I think, all of the. Um, yeah, we're rich. Okay. And then we have x train dot what do we have? I don't know. I guess we have out, right? I'm so bad I put that in my head. Oh no. Okay. Um then this is just doing a check. Okay. And we're using PyTorch to check of our work for us. Can you remind me why we're making a clone of uh, the input there? Is that because we don't want to uh, affect the original input because we still need it? Probably, yeah. Because this is saying we want to, this is going to attach the gradient to it, right? I guess if we're using it to check, we're using X and C places. But I don't know, maybe wrong. I um, didn't pay attention to that. So yeah, we have a, a new X. And we're testing, and I believe the test, if you don't have any output, means it passes. So this is saying that yeah, that's right. our gradient um, and the PyTorch gradient are close numerically. So our math is right. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So then we go through this, and I feel like I'm missing something. And he introduces the debugger. And where is it? Oh, right here. I am commenting it. So he says, okay, one way that you can help yourself to make sure this is doing the right thing is you can use the Python debugger. So he puts in this function, this line, import Python debugger, Python debugger set tree. This kind of works similarly to the our browser. Um, so if I redefine this function and now I call it through forward backward, it will put me in this debugging mode. And now I have this little box. Okay, I can press H to get all of the um, shortcut commands. Okay, and just like other debuggers, you're now in this function environment. So we could check and just make sure like, okay, out G 
we put it after this input G so we can check the um, shape of the gradient. Okay, we had 50,000 input and yes, we want uh, 50 output. And then we can run the next line. I believe, although I was having issues with this earlier. Okay, the next line. Yeah, so now I'm debugging down here in line seven so I can check my W gradient shape. Uh, wait. Invalid shape. Wait. Oh, because I summed. Maybe? I don't know. I was having a lot of issues with this earlier. Okay, maybe it's because W might be. W is a, oh yeah, W is a shortcut so well, that's why does that matter <laughs> uh, so if if you have any objects that have the same name as these shortcuts you have to use the p the print okay so the gradient is a vector here so we can yeah I'll check the shape it's 50. all right because that's how many um Weights, weights we had, I believe. Yeah. 784 times 50. Yeah. Okay. So that was just one tool he introduced. And then if I press C, it will continue. And it will continue in the forward backward function call, which has another call to linear grad. So I get jumped into this debugger again. Um, I'm just going to continue again. Okay, and now I'm out of there. Stop. Yeah, do you all use this? Or I guess, Ron, you said you have better debugger in your other. Yeah, I mean, in Visual Studio Code, even for notebooks, you have a nice visual debugger that has like the little side thing, the little uh, window on the side with the variables and Oh, nice. It's much nicer to, to deal with. You can have little buttons to step and skip and step into and everything else, though. I mean, it's nice to know how to do it this way, though, because sometimes, like, in this situation, you're on a server or whatever, or you need to be able yeah. to build the, the, the poor man's uh, command line. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Almost any IDE will have strong support for debuggers. Mm -hmm. it, it uses the Python debugger, but it just gives you a nicer view of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use um browser mode in R Studio sometimes. Yeah, I do too. I, I can't say I have that much experience with the Python debugger though. Yeah, it has a lot more um, command than the R Studio one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we're going to do the classic Jeremy thing and say, okay, we got it to work once. Let's now refactor our code. Okay, so here he starts introducing these classes. And this is a new thing for me. So this is called a dunder call. And you can make an instance of this class, but when you type it, it looks like a function but it's not a function is what I took away from this. Yeah, Python so, has a bunch of these. That's what I was referring to when I was talking about in the Slack message, you know, dunder, underscore, underscore, mate mall, map mall, yeah. underscore, uh -huh. underscore. Mm -hmm. So that will be what we use when you use the at symbol on an object like that. You can also do underscore, underscore, add. You can override or overload, I mean, all these different things that way. So the underscore, underscore, call, the dunder call, um, over, over, uh, overloads the call operator. So now when you call, you can do a call on, on this object and it will instead call this method. Yeah. So we're going to define... It's pretty cool. Yeah, it seems cool. A class for each of the layers and the MSE. So here's the ReLU. So on the self, um, you're going to keep the inputs and then you're going to put out this clamp min that we had before. Okay, and then we also define the for the backward propagation of the gradient. This is the calculation of the gradient. Or, or I should say, yeah, it's not 
wait here yeah this is just the gradient here yeah okay um here is the same thing for the linear uh, so this i guess is if you want to initialize a linear layer or initialize the class what what does this mean on this init yeah, the underscore underscore init thing, the dunder init method is called every time you first create an instance of an object. So it does all the initialization. Oh, in so you case, pass in the W and B, right? Yeah, so you call it, yeah, okay. you say lin W and B, and then it will call this method with the self, the hidden, all the self arguments are done for you. And then, yeah, uh, yeah so now it'll assign to self W and B, whatever okay. you passed in. And then every time in the future that you call it, it will do this. Yeah, the object okay. itself that you make, which is, yeah. So it's and capital I guess L I N is the is when you do a capital L I N, what open parentheses W and B you call the init method. When you call mm -hmm. whatever you made from that, you sign that to some variable. Whatever yeah. you made from that, then you, when you call that, right. it'll call the call method. If that I guess what's new for me here is like for some of these classes we don't have an init, uh, in there, right? And, and that's yeah. Yeah, if there's nothing to do, then it won't. Then there's no, you don't need it. Right? Yeah, because I guess for Relu and MSD. Yeah, they don't. They don't have they're just transformations. Variables. I guess. Yeah, exactly right. If the object doesn't have any instance variables, then you don't need to init, right? That's where those. That's where the instance variables are assigned. So each particular linear layer will have different Ws and Bs. So during the init methods, when you those get assigned to that particular one, well, there are no state variables for Relu. It's always the same. So. Or for mm -hmm. embassy. Mm -hmm. Well, there could be. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I guess that's like a user choice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here we have the initializer. This is the call. So this will do the linear transformation. Then on the backward, again, we have the gradient calculation. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then the MSE, uh, which here we don't have the input um, dimension changing, I guess is a little bit different. So I get, we're probably going to be more careful about that. Yeah. Okay, and then again, the backward for the backward propagation is two times. This is the difference now. But, so he does make a, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not gonna say that yet. Okay, so find these. And then all of these can be used for a specific model. So this model um, only has, right, two linear and one relay activation. And the loss is MSD. So these are kind of hard coded in here if you're going to use this. But now, uh, this is like what Jeremy's philosophy. These are with all these classes, instead of like copying and pasting with the code that we had before, we can just use all these classes to play around with this specific model. Um, so when we call this model with the weight. So, yeah, this step is creating. The first does model, the right? init, right? Yeah. yeah. The first does the called. initialization. Yeah. What'd you say? I said, yeah, this is where you just, we just, I was just talking over you saying the same thing, oh, yeah. not being very useful. No I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, but yeah, it's cool. So now this class, we call it like a function, but it's not really a function, right? Yeah, notice the difference. So it's big M. Big M model, you're creating an object instance called yeah. model little m, and now you're calling yeah. the instance itself. Yeah. That's getting and that's you're using that like a function. Yeah. That like a function. That's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah. Okay. It does everything for us. Okay. And then we can access some of these pieces. So model dot backward. Uh, we'll do the backward propagation. Oh yeah, so when we call model, it does all of the calls. And then when we say dot backward, it does all the back propagation. And then um, these are the mm -hmm. gradients we calculated above. We save them around, right? When you have one working, 
program, save it, and then test with something that you think is more approved so we can test all these and they are all good the same. Okay, so then we're just gonna keep refactoring again. So this time we're defining forward and backward and something that's not defined. I don't remember why we did this, but okay, so this time we have this module. Okay. And then now our classes take in this module. So yeah, he probably went over this too quickly, but um these are subclasses now. So everything that when you put the module in parentheses like that, when you say class uh -huh. relo. It looks like your calling module. What it really is doing is saying, hey, I'm a subclass of module. And I have everything that's in module, I also now have too, even though I'm not specific, saying oh, like, Okay, so this is like a, a template of a class? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is, I see now, like a template of a class. And then here now, so now all of them have the same thunder call. call. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, and then you give the specific method yeah. Okay. So you can see what happens in the Dunder call. It actually saves the arguments and saves the outputs. That's the key thing. Because he, yeah. he said we had a lot of repeated code where we constantly had to keep Paul passing in the inputs and outputs, which just saved Yeah, them. all of these right. calls are like the same, right? Yeah, there's a lot of repeated things in there. So he said, hey, I'll just take all that out. We'll just save them. We'll, we'll save the ins and outs in the, in the mm -hmm. layer. That way we'll have them. When we go forward, we'll save yeah. them. Then when we go, the point is when you go forward, we'll save them because we put in that call method in the in the uh, module and when mm -hmm. we go backwards they'll be there so we don't need to worry about them anymore yeah okay that was the point cool. of that just the refactoring um yeah and so now i guess we're using like a global backwards and a local backwards well so in a class like module which is a super uh you know it's meant to be a, not meant to be instantiated it's an abstract class yeah. so every subclass that like relu which is a subclass of module like you say it's a template it has to, you have to redefine its own force. So whatever it, when it, when you uh, call forward on a ReLU module, it will call this function forward inside its class, not the forward inside module because you've overridden it, right? And, and right. And so those functions within module are there as kind of like an error. Yeah, see, it says raise exception because mm -hmm. if you actually right. did instantiate a module and then call forward and say, hey, yeah. no. Or if you forgot to implement yeah. it in the subclass, it'll remind you then to you know, say, hey, yeah. not implemented. But backward is implemented, so it's fine. Not yeah, BWDs. so um, these BWDs are like the components of the chain rule, and then this is doing all of the propagation, right? Yeah, so you see what backward does. It calls self.bwd, which is also kind of meant to be short for yeah. backward, but it passes yeah. in those saved values, so you don't have to worry about it. Then inside your own definition, you only have to define BWD, mm -hmm. not the forward, I mean, not the backward, because it'll take care yeah. of the, the inputs and outputs for you. Okay. So, okay. So now, but we still have the same model class from before. Yeah, it still works because so this is the same. We just redefined these classes, so it still works. <laughs> we re redefined these. Yeah, okay. it's kind of cool. They could do that. Sure. It works. So I have a new model instance loss model dot backward. Okay. And yeah, we're just testing, make sure everything is the same. It is the same. And then we're going to test against the torch. <laughs> okay, so this is all from the torch. Okay, so they have this neural network module that we imported, I believe, from torch. Yes. So the cool thing about net and then module, it does a lot of the same kind of things, but it also takes care of the backward for you. So you don't have to do that either using All right. automatic differentiation. Yeah, you don't have to like give your, it use auto, auto differentiation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can though, you can define backwards. It's still legal. Like you may have some fancy algorithm that can very quickly yeah. calculate the uh, backward that would take, be slower to uh, do with autograph. Mm 
and then yeah, carries around the gradient. So these are the gradient uh, for the zero first layer. Okay. Okay. So it's essentially right. We need to move this one, I guess. Well, I don't. Yeah. So my we move in the negative direction of the gradient when we do gradient descent. Okay. Okay. So well, is there any other? That was for the MLP part. Yeah, so the dunder call. The advantage, he said, is we can use it like a function, but it's the instance of a class. And that was basically everything for the MLP part. And then he starts the next week. Um, oh, man, I'm getting close on time. So I can just, the main thing to get us ready for the next week are, okay, we did MSD which is not appropriate for classification. So we right. refreshed on cross entropy. And then there were some tricks that he introduced. So everyone here um, refreshed on your log and exponent rules. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this one, in the beginning, he introduces some tricks. Here is... Um, the softmax function. So this is how we go from continuous numbers in our uh, layers. So these xi would be like the output of the layer. So we would have, I guess, 10 of them. And then the softmax function makes sure each of those 10 probabilities are between zero and one. There softmax, I don't know how much y'all have used it in the past, can be numerically unstable, um, especially when these x's get really big. So he introduces this trick where, just by simple algebra, you can make each of these individual components less big by subtracting them all by the max. So A here would be the max of the xj's, and then to get back to the original scale, you just need to add it here and that will help with um, stability and then he mentioned a few times about it's is it, okay that's cross entropy here this is the sum right over all the categories and when you're actually programming it you don't actually need to um, do this sum you can do basically indexing tricks Right, you only need to add up the ones that correspond to the true label. Um, I think this notation kind of is weird, but so th this is a demonstration of that. So the true labels are five, zero, and four, right? So when we sum, if we did one hot encoding, all the other categories would be times zero. So we actually only need to sum up for these three observations, the prediction, um, the log of, this will be P5, P0, P4, right? So for um, observations one, two, and three, these are the three numbers. Um, it doesn't look like these are, oh, these are on the log scale. So these are already logged of the P of S. Um, so you can, think about using indexing as a trick in your computation rather than doing um, thumbs. And that's all he really got to in the beginning of this notebook. Set us up for next week. Which yeah. I think we have, if you again, Aaron, we have I think I'm taking right? over next week. Yeah. Okay. So cool. Yeah, well, thanks for sticking with us. Uh... Yeah, good job. Thank you for presenting. Great job. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for all your input, Ron. I didn't study hard enough on my. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's interesting <laughs> for you and me. 
I guess maybe mainly especially for you since you're an R user, but you're you know calculus, you know about I mean you know math, you know, all these things. So he, he slows down and carefully does like exponentials and logarithms. You're like, but then he's like, boom, here's a Python class, and we're gonna just subclass that. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you have like That's whiplash how, from like, doing doing all this stuff. Yeah. That's how grad school felt like. It was like very slow on the calculus and like here's all the statistical properties blah 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 blah. yeah it's like that's the stuff <laughs> he knows really well and he thinks that you know people take that course yeah. myself so not really well oh uh, how my students feel 